post session to uh, EGX Rush 2016. I'm Ollie Welsh uh, from Eurogamer. Uh, coming up in an hour's time, I'll be back with a few of my colleagues for a live edition of the Eurogamer podcast. So please join us for that. Uh, hi to everyone watching on YouTube as well, I should say. Uh, before then, uh, I've got this distinguished panel of guests uh, joining me to discuss what I think must be the hot topic in game development right now. It certainly seemed to be when I was out at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco a couple of we uh, weeks ago. What will VR games be like? There's a huge amount of excitement in the development community about VR at the moment, and I think it's because, as I realised when I tried HTC Vive here at Res for the first time last year, once you're in VR, you realise that a lot of your assumptions about video games need to be thrown out because some things that you thought would work aren't going to work anymore, and there are many, many new exciting possibilities alongside that. So joining me to talk about this today, we've got um, Katie Good. Katie is at uh, Triangular Pixels, working on Smash and Plunder, and also um, have just made the very popular Vive um, experience, Unseen Diplomacy. Uh, from End Dreams, we have George Kellyan and Jackie Tetley. They're working on an uh, uh, interactive story experience called The Assembly. And at the end, we've got Steve Bristow from Rebellion, uh, who's making Battlezone VR. Um, let's start with, uh, Katie, what was your first personal experience of virtual reality? So, uh, I actually used to work at Sony London Studio, uh, and it was uh, London Studio where they obviously they were starting to develop Morpheus concepts, uh, well, it's now called PlayStation VR. And so, uh, fortunately, someone managed to get hold of the Oculus Rift, like a DK1, and I was like, okay, I'm going to just like, give this a go and poke fun of it. Um, I've been developing AR before that, so I've been used to really different types of gameplay experience. But when I tried VR for the first time, I was running around in, uh, it was Minecraft, like in Minecraft mod. And wow, like, it was just absolutely mind-blowing. Like, it was entirely something different. And for the very first time, I actually felt like I was inside the game. I wasn't just observing it or just, like, it was just so different. It's really, really hard to explain about basically sounding like a marketing speaker person. <laughs> George, when you first tried VR, how did it change your thinking about it? Oh gosh, I mean the first time I tried VR was back in the early 90s at the Trocadero, playing uh, stuff on virtuality like uh, Exo Rex and Dactyl Nightmare, and, and I suppose the way that it changed my thinking at the time was I thought that by 1994, everyone would have VR headsets in their, in their living room. And it was a future that never really happened. The next time I tried VR was uh, actually the first modern VR demo I tried was skydiving, which is uh, an experience that, uh, developed in End Dreams. Um, and I suppose the way that it affected my thinking was, <laughs> I guess, it was like, well, this is it. This is, this is finally we're going to be able to see another uh, explosion in new ideas coming to, to video games. I mean, being a very personal level, I've, as, as much as I... I love all the experiences that have come out over the last 20 years. I'd say that the rate of new ideas and new mechanics that we've been able to layer into video games has slowly and gradually become more and more difficult to do because there are so many games out there and it's become much more iterative. Okay, let's add RPG elements to this, or let's add, you know, um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, or let's add crafting to that. And now with VR, we, we really have the opportunity to create entirely new game experiences um, and a really fresh way of looking at existing genres that anyone with a half imagination can get really excited by. It feels like we just needed this for a while, in my opinion. Jackie, how's your, your thinking about VR changed over the last five years? Because it's obviously been very, very rapid and developed. Yeah, so I think I, I haven't really had any hands-on experience with VR you know, until the recent iteration. My experience with things like you know, Lawn Mower Man, the movie, or the X-Files episode, First Person Shooter, where everyone's got VR headsets on, and it's kind of crazy. And, and so I was kind of very much fixed on a first-person environment, a first-person world, being the way I wanted to go. I wanted to be transported to another environment, you know, like being on the Star, Star Trek holodeck, being in another world, seeing, through, you know, seeing it through my real eyes, looking around, really experiencing that. I think... Now, you know, having been working in VR the last few years, it's, it's really, it's amazing how many more ways there are to do things and how, and how that's just kind of like the first go-to in my head, but you know, we're doing great third-person stuff, it's really fun to kind of play with scale and things are not to be 
just like being in another world, real life, straightforward kind of environment. It's, I think, just suddenly thinking, actually, there's so much more than just like I have been teleported to another world that can be done with it, and people are doing really great stuff with. And Steve, what, what excited you to get involved in, in VR? I think initially, uh, the extraordinary toy-like quality of, uh, of playing those, especially a lot of early demos uh, on the Oculus and so on. Um, yes, as you say, playing with scale, uh, the, the, the capacity to make yourself feel like a, genuinely feel like a tiny character, or a large character, or whatever it is. Uh, games have tried that in a, in a you know, what I suppose we now have to probably call flat games, i.e. non-VR games. And lots of them have done it quite successfully, but they require that you give your imagination to that window that you're looking at the game through. Whereas it's almost the opposite with VR. You know, you, you're, you, you almost have an instinct to, to, that it's slightly overwhelmingly powerful. When in, in Battle Zone, for example, we've really kind of gone to town with these like monolithic structures and initially people forget to play the game they're just they're just driving the tank around just like whoa you know and, it, and that's a, that's the first time i think i ever felt that uh, genuine sense of awe about the environment that i was in um you know the first time you see the, the hoop in halo it's a it's a it's a great wow moment but vr puts you in it you know it's you it's not it's not you're not watching master chief do cool stuff you are that guy. Uh, and this feels like we finally kind of caught up with the intention of the people that first made first person shooters to place you in the game. Uh, it's now sort of reaching a kind of a fulfillment where um, that, that sensation is incredibly powerful. And that's exciting. So it's, it's a really obviously exciting thing. As you say, it's a really obviously exciting prospect for everyone to, to, to enter the game world. But once you actually do that, you come up with quite a lot of problems in terms of design, in terms of how the players get to interact with, with the world. I mean, um, Katie, what were some of the uh, experiments that you might have, that you've tried in VR that just didn't work? That, the things you thought that might that didn't. Yeah, so um, we actually did like a small jam game called uh, Some Sandbox, where in that we try and make you feel like a toddler, uh, just by shrinking you down and the entire play space up. So you're playing around with uh, toys from like the 90s, which are giant versions of those toys. You think, oh, that surely must work. You must feel like a toddler. But it didn't. And that's because actually we found that baby humans have different proportions of body. You never feel like your body proportions change. Uh, so for us, it's like, yeah, that's sort of our failed experiment, I guess. Uh, otherwise, it's mainly just been sort of just iterating. And like the amount of iteration that we have to do be crazy compared to what you feel like is a normal flat game. Mm. Um, like for different comfort methods, uh, for different sort of feedback, for UI, like UI has been really a big challenge. Um, Why is that? Uh, so, because you want it to feel like it's in part of the world and like having just text floating somewhere just sort of drags you out a bit and makes you remember that it's a game and not just real life. It's sort of like a shame really. Like, You've got all this equipment, and then you're sort of breaking someone out by just having some floating text, which doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, we tried a thing uh, with showing players in time by having it up on the wall of the dungeon. Uh, and what we found was that's a terrible idea because they never look up there. <laughs> like, suddenly they can look everywhere. They're never going to look up on top of a wall somewhere. Uh, so, that was part of our iteration, we moved that to your hand, where you can check the time by looking at your watch, essentially, how much time you've got left. Oh, that makes much more contextual sense. So yeah, it's been like hard work as far as that's concerned. I guess uh, where the player is going to look is quite a challenge as well, isn't it, George? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, this has been uh, one of the things. So it, it, it's certainly with the assembly. The assembly is um, uh, a game which the narrative is very much the core of the experience and. In regular video games, flat screen video games, uh, you can rely on cutscenes to deliver narrative. However, in VR, you absolutely cannot take the camera away from uh, uh, the player's control. If you were to do so, then you're going to induce simulation sickness almost immediately. Uh, no one likes having their head or their view shaken around. Um, uh, so, in, and 
in VR, if we want players to look at a particular point in the in the in, in the in the level, or we want to we want some you know a particular object in the level to gain prominence, we really have to use a lot of techniques like funneling, or use lighting, or use audio to try and encourage the player to look in a particular place, you know, uh, rather than more you know uh, standard or uh, familiar tropes such as cutscenes. So yes, it's it's interesting. It's also exciting because these are the kind of you know having a new set of problems rather than just the same set of problems in different contexts is kind of what keeps game developers developing games. You know, rather than okay, you know, that's that's how great can we make this cutscene is not as exciting a challenge of right. We've got specifically we've got this this particular uh, object within the level the computer say that uh, we want the player to have some kind of we want to instinctively know that this is a, a big plot point that they've come across. How can we how can we do that without you know doing a, a whole mini movie about it? And, you, and I think I think we've been successful though. It's part of the game we haven't revealed yet, so I can't do it. Okay. <laughs> Steve, what were some, some things that you tried and, and maybe failed at Rebellion when you first got your hands on? on oh. the, uh... How long have we gone? <laughs> <laughs> many many things. The uh... Well, I mean, the very first mistake we made was uh, for a vehicular, it's a vehicular combat game, you're in a cockpit. Um, that helps us out with things like heads-up displays and so on, because we have reasonable surfaces to project these things onto. There are bits of cockpit that pop up. Um, but I was very keen to make a kind of a, an energetic and dynamic combat game. But initially, the head position was kind of locked to the vehicle, and as the vehicle rocks around and goes up and down slopes or whatever, uh, we were tipping the player's head around, which, uh, well, I mean, it seems rudimentary now. Lots of people have learned better, but it took us a while. That first step of decoupling the head movement, so the cockpit rocks around underneath you, but your head state is naturally stable, that helped us over a, a lot of our locomotion problems. Um, but in fact, the, the design of the environments, all of the environments, again, I was ludicrously ambitious with creating this kind of virtual roller coaster type of affair. Uh, and I imagined tanks leaping through the sky and, and uh, no, yeah, it, we, we've, we've made, a, we've made a, a kind of a much, we've simplified our environments a lot to create um, a more palatable experience for the user. Now, I mean, there was, there's a, there was a design reason for having these kind of slopes and so on. You know, it, it's a two, it's a, it's a first-person shooter, so I, my, my target field is important. I want enemies at different ranges and spaces on the screen. Um, but we've addressed that in other ways, and we've added, you know, we, we've changed the design of the game to compensate uh, by adding flying units and so on, and, and towers which are sort of high above you, um, to sort of draw the eye around to give you interesting targets to shoot at and so on. But uh, yeah, it's really easy to uh, hurt somebody's brain in VR, and you have to, you know, you do have to come up with smart solutions to those problems. Um, I guess this to all of you, is there anything that went unexpectedly right? Anything that you put in VR and it instantly was like, oh yes, that worked? The, uh, so what we did with Unseen Diplomacy, that started off again as a jam game, Trust me, you really have to do game jams if you can, because really cool ideas come from them. And uh, we originally called it Handgun Heist. And uh, yeah, you can guess where this is going. Basically, the idea was that you're supposed to infiltrate the, get the jewels at the end of the Hatton Garden place. And uh, I really wanted to experiment with, um, you know, like follow the wire type game. Like if you've got a little hoop, you try not to electrocute yourself along the wire but with your head somehow and somehow jump to the conclusion of oh you can crawl through ducks and uh, like physically like the vibe you can you got this room tracking so you can physically crawl around and that just worked like soon, all it was was there's no code it was just modeling this shape and me just crawling around on the floor for it because this is so fun just doing this um, and just finding out, it's like, oh yeah, of course this really works because, yeah, like, the, the kit is really awesome at showing you scale and, like, tight spaces actually feel tight, but also because you're crawling around the floor, you've got physical feedback of the floor on your arms, 
And so it's like free force feedback, <laughs> real world force, force feedback, which is really awesome and really works. So yeah, we pretty much just built our entire concept of a game of physicality because of that. Any other examples? Sorry, any other examples of stuff that you put in VR and just instantly? I, I don't want to speak for Jack's behalf, because she probably has better than me. One of the things I really, uh, I, I know that we experimented with was, uh, in, much like with UI, everything that exists in the, in the VR world, including audio, needs to exist at an object in 3D space. Um, much like how everything does in real life. And so, we wanted music in the game to try and amplify the emotion of the experience, much as you would do in, in, in a TV show or, or a movie. And so initially we had all of the music being piped out through iPod players that you would find in and around the environment. And it wasn't as elegant as just having a score, a background score. And we, and all of our thinking up until we tried it was this, it's not gonna work because it's gonna feel a bit weird. Like no one walks around their life with a soundtrack going around with them to amplify what they're doing. Turns out it works really well. It works really well. Like just normal, uh, you know, musical scores uh, that you'd find in, in, as I say, in, in TV or, or in other video games, amplify drama fantastically, and they don't need to exist in, uh, in 3D space. All other audio, though, as far as I'm aware, definitely does need an object to be uh, attached to. I think a lot of people at first with VR were initially caught up with the excitement of, think of thinking all the game genres they like and transposing those into VR and thinking, wouldn't it be great to be the Witcher or the Space Pilot or whatever, but um, there are quite a lot of problems with bringing traditional game styles across into VR, aren't there? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'd say like definitely because, um, like for example, I was playing a game where you're on the back of a dragon and you're flying around in VR and it was amazing, but whoa, did I feel really bad afterwards. Uh, and part of that is because locomotion is a really hard problem in VR without making people feel off. Uh, and so some games just won't work when the fun and enjoyment of the game comes from that locomotion. For example, flying on a bird or something like that, you go, oh, that'd be amazing, and actually it'd be really bad. Um, and you have to do a lot of work to try and make it comfortable for some people. And um, still won't be comfortable for everybody. As well, um you know, movement, you know, touching on the movement side of things, it's kind of, you know, the assembly is a first person game where you're freely moving around the environment. And actually, you know, that, that's the kind of game mission you think, oh, Call of Duty, that'd be amazing, or Sky, and I'm running around. And then when you actually try that kind of movement system, traditional twin stick FPS, you know, movement, at that kind of speed and turning your head around and moving the stick at the same time, it's actually can be quite overwhelming. So, you know, with the assembly, we've, we've kind of been working on ways so that people can still move around freely in the environment, but it, it's not too overwhelming for players. Because I think, you know, there is this vision very much of this, you know, these games that people have got the idea in their head that they're going to be so awesome to play, but if you actually sit down for a minute and you think about, like, I can't turn my head that quickly in real life. So if I, if I then start, you know, my camera's controlled by that, if I start whipping my head around with a stick, you go, you know, and the movement rate is really accelerated it's really disorienting and you're not used to it. So I think, you know, there's been some great, I mean, we've worked on some great stuff at the assembly, but obviously we're not a fast-paced sort of running around game, we're an exploration adventure, so it it's kind of works for us. We, we sort of are on that, you know, that we, we've had to tackle those kind of issues head on um, because it's an arcade game. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's meant to be a, you know, a dynamic and, and fast-paced arcade game. Uh, so some of the things that have worked for us as I was saying before, the, the, the subtle tipping of the vehicle as it moves around helps to signal your, the intent of the vehicle. Initially, when we were reading up on things, do's and don'ts for VR, one of them was suggesting that you should have linear movement, that you shouldn't have accelerations and decelerations. And I think, well, certainly in our case, that's turned out not to, not to actually be true, so long as you signal that acceleration to it. So as you, as you move the vehicle, it's, it tips and then you start to understand that you're going to be moving forward, and that all just naturally works. Another thing that I think is really important is the design of our environments are, we've got lots of near, middle, and far ranged objects that helps to uh, enhance that parallaxing sense around you. But we've all, always got a horizon of some kind. We had a few levels that were canyons, where you would go down into canyons, and that suddenly became unpleasant again, because you've lost your peripheral sense of a horizon. Uh, and that simulation signal started to, to come back again. And another thing that you'll see in Battlezone is 
Um, there are, we've got little moats of little glowing moats in the in the air all, all around you, wherever you are in the levels, which shift as you shift, and it and it all all combined, it sort of starts to work to set your mind at ease about the fact that you're moving around laterally, um, and, and more to the point, that sensation you get when you're sliding one way and looking another, which is a trigger for a lot of people's uh, motion sickness. We want to we want to get close to that sickness <laughs> with battle zone. You know, we want to we want players going whoa, you know, and, and and feeling that sort of thrill ride sensation. And I think from the certainly from the feedback we've had from the, the demos we've done, nearly everybody who's played the game, I think we've got pretty close to nailing that. Um, but it's yes, it's taken up the bulk of our kind of experimental time. I mean, you know, we're fully in production now, but I'd be lying if I said that there weren't still elements of prototyping going on in our process. But if you ask me, it's just a testament to how far we as people who are working in VR have come in the last 12 months alone. You know, talking about locomotion in 3D virtual space, you know, th this time last year, a little bit earlier than this time last year, that was considered still by some to be a relatively intractable, intractable problem, if that's the word correctly. Um, whereas now, a year later, there are lots of different solutions being come up. And because we're still in the stage where the only people who are really playing VR games a lot of the time are either developers or journalists, there, there aren't consumer headsets out in the wild, everything is still very much discovery and, and, um, and the first time you're trying to do things. As soon as we've got a, a range of games released, we can look to other people's ideas and iterate, and, and you get these, these uh, common standards of practice that, uh, uh, that will occur. For example, how in current flat screen gaming you've got first person shooters all gravitating towards either the Halo or the COD system. And we can look forward to, to some of these designs becoming more generally accepted, but I think it's amazing that we've taken something that people said a year ago, oh, I mean, I'm, I don't even know if they're ever gonna fix this, and now it's like, actually, you can do it this way, you can do it this way, you can do it this way. <laughs> One of the things I'm really enjoying about developing VR is the is the sort of um, the, the collegiate, the conversation that's going on between developers. You know, we're all in this undiscovered country, and we're all faced with a rule book that hasn't been written yet. And um, it's it's been fantastic to to get feedback from other developers. Ordinarily, we're quite secretive and buttoned up about what we're doing. Um, but we're all trying to screw the last gram of gameplay out of a well-understood system, so it tends to be like that. The, the, the community around VR development has been fantastic. I mean, we've had quite a lot of contact with Sony. Uh, they've been very forthcoming and extremely helpful uh, in our development process, from a technical standpoint as well as from a, you know, we've tried this on a thousand people and 700 of them didn't like it, 300 did. And, you know, the, these bits of information have been invaluable. Um, but yeah, mostly just the way developers are talking to each other about this stuff is, is great fun. Uh, I want to take some questions from the floor in a second, but I think before we do that, we should try and answer the question we posed at the start, or something a bit like it. So, how will the VR game of the future be different from video games as we think of them now? So, um, I think the biggest one for me is the physicality, especially when you start getting your hands into VR. Like the ability to really reach and do, like, like I said, like the diplomacy is a physical assault course. Just could not do that before. So you're going to see a lot more range of games. So there's going to be, yeah, sitting down games. There's going to be motion games, like you know, back in the week. But only there's going to be whole room games now, and like escape the room game in <coughs> VR, where you actually have to escape the room. <laughs> It's, yeah, there's just this whole other level of genres that are going to be opened up. And it's so hard to describe what our game is because there isn't a genre for it yet, which is awesome. Uh, I think, for me, that this falls broadly into two categories. The stuff that you can imagine and the stuff that you can't. <laughs> the stuff that you can imagine is uh, obvious things like diorama games. So take the experience you normally have on a tabletop, your Warhammer 40k or, or Hero Quest or anything like that. Or, or even just if you've had an RPG where you've got some friends around and you've got a dungeon master, now stick that in VR and then all those little figurines are animated, they're, they're beating each other up, they're fighting each other, you can lean in, get really close, you can pull back, you know, you don't have the problem with the RTS games where you can't see the whole map at any one time, you can just literally lean in and tilt your head and see the whole thing, it just 
brings it all to life. And it, I mean, for, take God games, for example. You'd actually feel like you were God because you'd have that sense of presence. Now, that, that's the stuff that's easy to imagine. The stuff that's hard to imagine is you have to remember that, that this is still very much the, the uh, Lumiere Brothers uh, stage of VR. When, you know, when, when radio first came out, it was used to, to deliver opera. And when TV first came out, it was used to broadcast theatre. And it was only over a course of time that people came up with experience that really um, were well suited and made the best use of those mediums. And the great thing about VR is that we don't really know right yet in 2016 all the amazingly awesome things that we're going to be able to do with this medium. We're, we're looking at the next, potentially the next evolutionary phase in entertainment technology. So I think one has to have uh, a certain element of it's going to be amazing, but we don't know what it is yet, in terms of conversations of what VR games are going to be like. I'm pretty excited about uh, the multiplayer and social side of things. So I've been really interested in some of the sort of more asymmetrical multiplayer games that have been coming around, like keep talking, they've explodes, you know, these kind of you know, really interesting ways of like, okay, one person's got the headset on, they can see certain things, and other people can have another device with another screen or the TV or just you know, pieces of paper, and the kind of way that it gets people to work together and you know, how you can devise gameplay for these two, you know, two or three different ways of doing things. I think that's been really interesting, I some really, I think that's some really great games coming out. And also just the social side of things, you know, you know, and dreams. You know, originally used to do work on PlayStation Home, and I just love the idea of that kind of like going into an environment and hanging out with people. You know, rather than being, you know, remotely talking to someone on Skype, you could just go in and sit next to them and watch a film together with them, and you could turn your head to look at them and go, "Ah, oh, this is awesome!" Or you're, you know, and then look at the screen, both of you, and it's just kind of that nice enhancing of lots of experiences to be really social. Yeah. Again, when we when we first started out, I think we were sort of under the assumption that you were pretty much just going to have to do first person games because you know, that's that, that was the point of VR. And that's very much not the case. I mean, some of the most fun I've had uh, on, uh, from Oculus demos and so on has been in third person, as you say, sort of tabletop style games, little really quite conventional standard tower defense games become enormously pleasing. Uh, and initially I kind of thought, well, this is just the novelty value of VR and it will wear off and it will become commonplace. But I've been, I don't know, I've got hundreds of hours of VR now, and it sort of doesn't, you know, the, that, that, that initial wow moment of putting it on maybe, but the joy of having miniature characters moving around on the landscape is, uh, is, is great fun. I just want to take this opportunity to tell the people who are making War Tile to make sure they do a VR version, for example. If you don't know about it, look for it, it looks great. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, the social screen stuff that PSVR are uh, offering, no doubt that would, that would be mimicked in other ways, that just opens a new door. I mean, that's just a new thing that we couldn't really do. You know, you can't, you, you couldn't previously play a multiplayer game where one of you was blindfolded in a, 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 a you know, well, not, not one that's pleasant for everybody in the room anyway. Uh, and, and that's, you know, they're, they're, I, I'm thinking on to, you know, maybe other things we can do with some of the, the properties that we've got at Rebellion. The combination of top-down strategy, yeah, I know what you're going to say, you know, like, you know, uh, <laughs> um, the combination of sort of a first person playing against humans who are controlling the game in a kind of a top-down strategic type of way, just sounds great fun to me. Uh, and the things that the, the VR player does and doesn't know about what's going on in the world around them. Um, that's, well, I mean, the, the, the Playroom VR demo demonstrates just the tip of the iceberg there, I think. That's, there's going to be a whole new explosion uh, of, of social VR games. And, I, and, I, and honestly, I think that was probably something that most people were, apart from you who invented it, uh, who uh, most people probably thought was a problem with VR. Yeah. Was that it wouldn't be particularly social, that you would be isolating yourself and play it. Uh, far, far from it, I think, quite the contrary, in fact. Um, so that, that's, that's very exciting <laughs> from the design's point of view. Okay, I'd like to take some questions from the floor. Oh, one more. I was going to say, I think my favourite quote about this was uh, John Riccatello, who's XEA now in Unity, described VR as being a staggering orgasm of the new. Which is <laughs> <laughs> a hell of a quote. But it's true. I mean, he, he's right, it's great. It's like a pre-Cambrian explosion of ideas. 
All right, uh, we've got a mic out in the centre aisle, so if you've got a question, just come and line up behind the mic. Shoot. Hello. Hello. Um, so, one thing I was thinking of, in kind of board games and tabletop games that you kind of mentioned, there's the implicit trust of the player that they won't break the rules that have been set out for them. In most computer games, that's not there. It's, there's these systems and you can try and break them, but um, the player is completely constrained by them. Um, in VR, is, is, does there need to be more trust of the player? Is the solution to how do you stop the player sticking their head through the wall, just let them stick their head through the wall if they want, it's up to them not to break it, or will there have to be systems to prevent that sort of thing? Yeah, so we've got, uh, uh, I guess, a really good example of the head stick through the roof fit, the wall thing. But to begin with, Alt Space VR has, uh, like, that's like an MMO thing with any sort of VR device that you can join in with. They have board games in there, and I think you can basically break the rules if you want to, because it's just a normal board game, just happens to be in virtual reality. So that's quite interesting. Uh, but for head, like putting your head through the wall, we actually found that most players just really didn't want to do it because it's really horrible. Like, you don't want to do it in real life because you can't. <laughs> you hurt yourself, but you feel like you can hurt yourself in VR as well. So, we like have like, an interesting, complicated system for Smash It Plunder that we have ideas for to make sure that you can't put your head through objects and cheat, as it were. But people just don't want to do that. And it's amazing that, especially with like great sort of short experiences, and you have them like an exhibition or public setting, people always want to play along. They want to role play. They want to enjoy it at its maximum capacity. And it's only potentially when they're like private in their own homes and played the game quite a few times through or something, then they start pushing it and seeing where the boundaries are. In uh, PSVR, in particular, has um, you can constrain the the valid headspace using the, the camera's field of view. So for example, we've got a cockpit game, uh, so we can make it so that the game warns you when you're about to do something weird with your head, uh, which you, you can just be able to work out. Um, so, and then in RoomScale VR, uh, Vive and so on, again, you, you, know, you know, you can, the virtual world can indicate to you that you're about to break its rules. So there are lots of little catches for that sort of stuff. But again, our experience is the same uh, as yours, Katie, that, that um, you've gone to all this trouble to get into an illusion, and most people uh, don't want to deliberately break that illusion. So I, I <coughs> sort of feel like it's a problem we don't really have to solve. Uh, people do tend to react to the virtual environment as if it was the real world, but it's specifically one way you can stop people, What the way that we uh, get around people wanting to hit, hit, stick their head through the wall in the environment is uh, it, we just uh, turn the screen to, to black and then immediately the people's the natural instinct is just to return to the uh, away from it, to, to reverse what they've just done. Uh, and it works, it, it's, it's actually elegant and people basically, if ever, try it once, if ever they do do it, then they, they never do it again. But you. You, you respond and you process the virtual world like you respond and you process to the real world. So you, you tend not to do game-breaking things. Now, I'd probably just set a challenge to ask you everybody <laughs> with a, with, you know, who's a YouTuber and planning on getting a VR headset, but we'll, you know, we'll see. Uh, next question. Um, hi. Yeah. Um, many games, um, um, most of the VR sets have, have an extra that you have the monitor, you know, displaying what person that's seeing. Have you ever have you actually experimented with using that monitor for its own thing to you know, maybe display for another counter or maybe, as you say with the UI text example, you could maybe display some start construction and then you put it on? Is the kind of mixing of both 2D screens and other things like tablets together with, with uh, VR? You know, the kind of, kind of mixing those different game modes together? So, um, we actually did this back in October 2014. It was yeah. the first time we started doing this. So we came with this idea of what we call the shared screen, but everyone now calls the social screen because it's Sony. <laughs> so yeah. this because we just found that like it was with the gear, the gear VR, and you couldn't see what was happening inside the kit. So out of necessity, it was like, okay, we'll put like this view on the screen, 
But we don't want to do this weird, distorted view that looks pretty rubbish and full of spoilers and things. So we had a top-down camera and like a little 2D map of what was going on and like gameplay information on there. And it was amazing. It was like the centerpiece of the uh, game that we were demoing. And people weren't just looking around at the VR unit, but they were also looking at the screen yeah. and joining in. Like saying, oh no, it's behind you, it's behind you. Because they could see different information and this asymmetrical information was so powerful. Um, so we extended that onto uh, what we called Double Destruction, which was our Oculus VR Jam winner, like last year, where we actually had gameplay on that second screen. So mm -hmm. the Gear VR and then someone else on their mobile phone or tablet can join in and gameplay actually with you. Uh, and now the fact that Sony are actually encouraging that with features in their SDK, with the social screen, with actual players joining in, as you see in Playroom, it's just like, thank you, thank you for putting that in, because we're gonna so totally do something awesome with this, because it's so cool. Because you don't wanna be the one where you're sitting with your family around you, and you're going, oh, this is awesome, and you can't see it. And then everyone's just sitting there going, so jealous. And it's like, I feel sorry for those players outside. So I wanna make sure the players outside enjoy it as much as the player inside. Well, I like thinking, you know, about design involving <coughs> kind of an online offline thing for you just as a, a single player almost. So, you know, like maybe you don't want to wear your mobile VR headset on the train, but you still want to make some progress in the game that you're playing. So games yeah. which will have a sort of, you know, an element you can play with a headset and an element that you can then play offline, you know, offline, you know, non-headset. You know, I think that's going to be something that's definitely going to happen more and more. Yeah. You know, as VR grows, I think that's you know a lovely way for people to be able to kind of yeah. And then you can do you know you have certain things you can only do just with you know using the touch screen and certain things you can only do using the headset. So it kind of be some super fun mix mechanics. I'm speaking that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like that sounds great. I mean, you can you can easily think of it in a narrative wrap as well. Say you're in a uh, <coughs> there are plenty of spaceship games coming out. In the, in the near future, and as we've just discussed, traversal can be difficult to achieve um, in first-person uh, VR. Uh, so it's not impossible to think of a situation whereby when you're on the planet, or what have you, and you, and you don't have your you don't have your cockpit around you to, to combat sim sickness, um, you would be playing on a flat screen. Then when you want to get into your, your spaceship, all of a sudden your VR helmet becomes like your spaceship helmet, you know, your, your spaceman helmet, you put that on, bam, you're in space. Why not? So, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's... The only thing I would say to that is that it's going to be annoying, and anything that gets in the way of the... People find it annoying looking between two screens, I think people are going to find it annoying being encouraged to... Undone. Exactly, uh, you know, yeah. but maybe I say that and every time anyone in the video games industry ever says, oh no, that'll never happen, somebody makes it amazing, so... <laughs> um, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, but that's a good note to end on. Uh, thank you very much for coming, stick around uh, if you're watching online for the Eurogamer podcast at uh, 5. But for now, thanks very much to our panellists, Katie, George, Jackie and Steve. Thank you.